that we do. So, yeah. um, we've been uh, so we're, we're doing the uh, lesson, um, and you know this is on been on the covenant, and this today's lesson uh, that we're going to be studying uh, is on the Sinai co covenant, um, and. Uh, one of the interesting things is, do you remember what you were doing three months ago? Yes, I do. What, what day do you want? No, okay, that's good. So you, you're, 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 you're on top of, you're, 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 you're that person, okay. Um, you know, so I know that I was, you know, three months ago, um, I was working and nothing really stands out, but I do remember, you know, events, you know, that took place. I know my mom came to visit, you know, things like that. So. It's not too far. My wife tends to have a, she says she has like short-term memory problems, which she'll immediately say like, what did, did I just take that pill? I'm like, oh, yes, you just, I just saw you do that, you know. Um, but we forget, but it seems like um, it's only been three months since Israel was uh, fleed from Egypt. They are now at the border here at, at, Mount, at Mount Sinai. So it's been three months since they left. And a lot of things have happened in three months. And I think those are things that even I, if I forget, I, I think I would remember. But, you know, uh, I think that's probably, yeah, you, you cross the street. Yeah. What are some of the other things? You know, there's a, you know, being hot, like we were talking about weather, right? And so having a cloud, you know, if you're walking even today, you know, it'd be nice to walk under the shade of a, a, a cloud uh, and at night to have kind of this fire that keeps you warm, keeps your temperature, especially in the desert, right? Where you know, the temperature extremes can, can vary very quickly. I think you'd remember that. And water coming from a rock. You know, all these amazing things that are, have taken place. But yet, um, I think it's just human nature. We have a tendency to forget. Uh, and I think it's very normal for us to forget things. Um, and uh, uh, so I was just, that, that was the first thing I just kind of like, okay, so they've gotten to this point now. All these amazing things have happened, and yet over and over, um, they seem to have forgotten. And you know, I gotta almost cut them some slack because for me, the this whole notion of scripture is this narrative of God making a promise and keeping His promises. God being faithful, um, and the promise that He made to Abraham. Now, it's been He told him like in four hundred years, you know, they were going to be enslaved, and so now they're. They're, they're at this point now where they've been delivered and um, they have been for 400, you know, for several centuries, um, been enslaved. And so, you know, that I'm, I'm just kind of thinking, like, what kind of psyche, what kind of mentality do you think that these people, you know, came from and had? Because obviously the knowledge of God had been lost. Uh, they had been living in a pagan, you know, Egyptian culture, which believed in many gods, believed in uh, salvation by works, the things that you do, and, and then they were slaves, so they were also working. You know, they, if something needed to happen, they made it happen. They were slaves, whether they were gathering water, whether they were bringing in cooking, whatever it was that they were doing, they were oppressed, they were doing things, they were making bricks, you know, helping with projects. They were the ones that got stuff done for the Egyptians, in essence, right? To it's, all gone. it's all gone. You're right. You're, it, it, it doesn't take very long for new customs and new things to be implemented and kind of a new way of life, right? So, you know, I, I keep saying, I got to cut them some slack because they, they've been through a lot. They've been through very difficult situations. And for many generations, they have, all they've known is slavery and they've known this way of life. And so um, the whole process that God goes about to bring them out is very revealing and especially when you look at it in light of Christ's ministry when he came he almost seems to kind of trace the same steps as Israel you know coming through you know as Israel came through you know the river you know uh, they were in Egypt Jesus you know Matthew especially the book of Matthew really kind of almost chronologically goes through almost like point by point retracing Israel's steps all the things that Israel failed Jesus seems to complete which is something 
that I think we need to keep in the back of our minds when we, when we talk about the, the covenant and when we talk about Sinai and the law and all these things is all the things that God is faithful. I, and I think that, that was to me in, in, in reading and understanding the covenants for me, it just comes down to something that's very basic and you'll hear me say it over and over is that God's faithfulness is, is really the key. It's not what we do, it's what he has done and what he has completed. And, and, and that's the essence of the gospel. And, and I think that even for, you know, when we, you just read, you know, this portion of Sinai in terms of God giving the law, you know, for some people it might seem like it's a very different type of covenant that God is making, but it's really the same covenant. It hasn't changed. It's still about love. I mean, you can reduce, you know, the, the, the law as, as being love and life. God's offering love and life to, to Israel, and he's giving them more detail now that they've, you know, they've come out of this place. Um, in Exodus 19, um, verse 4, is kind of, uh, uh, kind of the start of the lesson. It says, uh, you have seen what I did uh, to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. I think over and over in a lot of these promises, you know, Exodus 19, 4, um, or in a lot of the covenants God makes, they seem to be very um, one-sided. You know, they're totally one-sided. You know, when he told Abraham, he says, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. It's always about what he's going to do. And one of the amazing things is for Abraham, you know, it was like, what did it say that, what did Abraham do? He believed he had faith. He believed what God said was going to happen. And then it says it was counted to him as righteousness, right? Because he believed. And belief is the only thing that we bring to the table is to accept and believe what God says he's going to do. That's really, in my mind, the, the, if I had to break it down, that's the basic essence of the gospel is that we believe what God says and what he says that he's going to do, both in us in future tense and what we have in him like we are his sons and daughters and I think that living with that kind of mentality changes the way we experience and go about life because if we have that essence that we are saved and we have um, redemption already is has been purchased uh, for us then I don't have to live with a burden because I know I've been freed you know right and so here we have the Israelites the same thing coming out they have been freed but I don't think that they've accepted that identity of being freed yet because God wants to, wanted to free them from the bondage, but I think it's more than that. I think it's more than just the bondage of slavery, uh, but it's also from the bondage of sin. He wanted to free them from that bondage, and I think that those are the, some of the things that we're going to be kind of, that the lesson I think kind of covers, um, uh, you know. In the, in the, um, he says that he bore them on eagles' wings. Uh, probably in Canada, you guys probably see eagles, right? You, you guys see, you know. Now, I've never, I've, never ex I've never seen them. I've seen them like in like National Geographic where, you know, you know, they tilt and they drop them and they swoop back down. I've never seen it in person, but it must be a pretty amazing thing to, to watch. Yeah, when they come and land and pick up that sound. Yeah, yeah. And it's wiggling alive. Yeah, yeah. Drop. Oh, wow. <laughs> so the fish were taking him down. Taking him down. <laughs> I don't know what the final outcome of it was, but that eagle was riding that fish for a long, long way. <laughs> <laughs> trying to swim to shore or drag it to shore. But he was too much current, too much power in the fish. Right? Yeah, th and those are very powerful uh, fish. They're just muscle, you know. But this analogy that, that he uses about, um, you know, bearing them on eagles, I mean, um, is this kind of, uh, there are these teaching moments, right? So obviously the eagle, to teach the youngling to how to fly, you know, has to take him up to a certain height and has to drop them to get them to learn and, and instantly right to take over and, and then comes back and swoops down and catches them and I guess repeats that process until they get the hang of, okay, that's who I am. I'm, I'm a bird, I'm meant to fly, right? And so they do that. And I, and I think that's it's a, it's a beautiful illustration that God uses to represent what he has done for Israel. 
is that he's bore them on his back. Basically, he's, he's taken care of them um, and, 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 and brought them out with these, you know, incredible um, um, uh, signs of and wonders, right? In, in, you know, like you said, parting of the, the, the sea, you know, being able to walk on dry land, being a cloud, all these things, uh, the destruction of the, uh, the enemy, you know, before them, you know, um, and, you know, all these things is just pretty amazing, uh, all the things that, uh, that, that took place uh, and, and brought them out, showing his care for them, you know, and even in feeding and providing the manna, uh, providing water, all those things. And so, you know, I guess, you know, in light of the character of God, the picture of God that we're seeing being painted here, you know, how does that, you know, how do we then relate to those things? You know, how, do, how does it make us feel uh, as we go through struggles? Um, you know, do we feel like, you know, I'm on my own in this, or uh, do we have that sense that God is really, you know, watching over us, you know, uh, and bearing us? Um, and maybe some of us have had maybe personal experiences that we know that God has brought us through trials, right? That he has worked miraculous, in miraculous ways. Um, I know that I can testify to, you know, examples where I've seen just God working, lining things out, you know, um, where, you know, where, you know, there's, I'm, I'm in the architecture profession, so I'm, I'm, I'm an architect, I have a practice, and in architecture, like anything else, it's cyclical building, you know, it's like feast or famine, and uh, there are times where it's been famine, and, you know, got laid off, no job, trying to find, you know, having a young family, trying to figure out, okay, you know, how, how are we going to do this? Um, and seeing how the Lord has been faithful to his promises to me and that he wants to because that's who he is. He's a God of love and so he, he cares for me and so I know that you know, he provided a job uh, and a project you know, just you know, going to like the unemployment and somebody had put a little thing on there that said they needed a, somebody to draw some, you know, an architect to draw something. And I was like, that doesn't really happen. People usually don't do stuff like that. You know? And so little things are like, wow, you know, the Lord just provided in, in many ways. And so um, it, I look at just in, in, in my own personal experience, t looking back time after time, I always see God's hands working through, being faithful, despite of my unfaithfulness. And I think that when I see that, when I can acknowledge and say, hey, you know, I have been unfaithful, um, but yet he is always faithful. And to me, that love that he expresses to me, all of a sudden, I want to serve him. I want to do these things, not because I have to, but because I want to, because he has shown so much love to me. Love begets love. You know, it's just kind of, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm moved by that. And, and, and I think that that's really what God wanted to do for his people here in Israel by bringing them out, showing them his love, showing them his care. And, you know, and, you, know you can think, wow, they were, you know, it's like the, the army was right behind them, just get, getting ready. And it's kind of almost bringing them to that edge, you know, but it was to show them to trust him that he was going to take care of them. He was going to protect them, and and he did. And over and over, he he showed he showed that, um, and uh, you know that must have been an, an incredible experience for them uh, to have seen all those things. Um, but you know, a lot of times, uh, I've heard a lot of uh, people say, "Well, you know, they were just they were so hard." You know, you know, we talk about them. They were they were so hard headed. They were you know stiff necked people. You know, and I'm wondering, well. I'm wondering whether I would probably just go along the same way. You know, am I, am I really that much different than them when I compare to when I have a trial, do I easily forget or, you know, try to figure things out on my own, you know, and, you know, and, and I can say, well, you know, I, in other ways, I'm probably very similar to them in that I, maybe my, sometimes my first initial reaction is to try to solve the problem on my own, um, especially if, if you're wired to and you do this all the time and you're solving problems for other people, you think, well, well, I'll try to figure it out, right? And, and so, right, right, you, you know, it is, is you, you try to, we try to figure things out. Um, and yet, in it, I find this beautiful thing where God offers rest. He offers us a different way because he fought their battles. Um, and there was a part that they had to play but that part that they had to play was that of trusting in him and having faith in him. Um, and, and it seemed like there's this, um, the, the lesson brought out this tension between 
works and obedience and faith, you know. Um, and it seems like there was, there's, there's a right way of doing it, and then there's a wrong way of doing it. Because, you know, where, where the focus lies is on, I'm saved because of, a lot of times even, um, we can take a verse like we're saved by faith. It seems like by my faith, it seems to put the focus on us as opposed to my faith in Christ or Christ's faithfulness in keeping and doing all those things. There's a little slight difference in how that gets interpreted, but in essence, the focus becomes, is it my faith that saves me? Or is it God's faithfulness and my faith in Christ and what he's done for me that saves me? So, you know, subtle nuance, but I think it makes a big difference in how we relate and in why we do certain things. Um, So um, there was a pattern, uh, the Monday's lesson was uh, uh, about a pattern of salvation. Um, and um, in Exodus 6.6, 6, um, it says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will redeem you um, with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So again, you know, as the Lord interacts with um, Moses, telling him all these things, I just keep seeing, I will deliver you. I will redeem you. You know, with great, you know, acts, I will take you to, for, for my people. I will be your, all these things is I, very, very one-sided. And I know that, um, I have a partnership with um, my partners, you know, and uh, they expect certain things, right? You have a contract, and you, if, you're, if you're a partnership, you're in business, you enter a contract with somebody, uh, an agreement with somebody, that they're going to do one thing, and you're going to do the other, or how you're going to run your business, you're going to manage marketing or whatever, and you're going to do, you know, whatever, you, whatever that arrangement is, there's an arrangement, there's an agreement that, that comes into take place. And it's like, who you enter an agreement with you know, like a business, I, w I was always told it, it's like a marriage. So you have to really be careful about who you enter, you know, into business with because, you, you know, it's especially if it's long-term or whatever, you, you know, it's a, it's a serious thing. And so you need to know that person. You know, you, 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 you want to know who your partners are, right? You, you want to know who you're do doing business with, whether they're reputable and maybe before you make the deal, you want to know that um, they're of the right character, right? So that... Uh, uh, when things get tough, which are probably bound to, or issues come up, that there is a way to resolve things and be able to, to talk, right? Um, those, are, those, are, those are some of the things that I think God was kind of demonstrating, I think, you know, who he was, showing them who he was in terms of his character, that they could trust him, that he would keep his word, um, it, and all those acts that he's shown them. Um, and, and for me, it's, again, it's just the fulfillment of the promise he made to Abraham, long time ago that, you know, through him, you know, he was going to uh, grow him to be like the stars numerous, a great nation was going to be created. Um, and, and to me, that, that promise was such a broad promise. Um, and, and Abraham believed it in his old age, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, he, he, he believed it. But even Abraham went through that process as well, where he thought, hey, I'm going to help God. And so we're going to, you know, and so then God provides the uh, uh, the ceremony of uh, uh, circumcision just to show them that it's in spite of you <laughs> you know we're going to cut that thing off <laughs> and you know and I'm still going to make it happen you know um, um, amazing uh, uh, amazing uh, faithfulness uh, uh, of God um, but this word um, to redeem um, it has um, several different uh, um, meanings and it's used in the Bible uh, a couple of different ways um, and the, the, the word, um, the first word of redemption is agorizo. It's in the Greek. Um, and it tells us that Jesus Christ came to earth to locate us in our depravity and personally inspect our slavery to Satan. So he was like, that's one of the ways is just getting to know. So he comes down to, um, um, to, to the word for redemption is to, to locate us and see where we are uh, in that the second word for redemption is exagorizo, uh, declares that Jesus came not only to inspect our condition, 
but to permanently remove us from Satan's power, um, to, to take us from, you know, from his power. Um, the third word for redemption is lutru, and tells us that Jesus was so dedicated to delivering us from Satan's dominion that he was willing to pay the ransom price of his own blood. That's the third way um, that the word is used, for rede redemption. And then the fourth word for redemption is apolustrosis, tells us in addition to permanently setting us free from Satan's hold, Jesus restored us from the position, restored us to a position of sons of God. Now we are fully restored and made joint heirs with Jesus Christ himself. Um, which is, to me, is like a, an amazing and hard to get my head around that, um, but I have to believe it because it's, the word says that I am a joint heir, you know, and that, you know, that Jesus himself is going to share his throne with me. That's pretty, pr pretty amazing uh, to, to, to be able to, uh, to think of that. But it's an, an issue of identity. Is like, who do we, you know, knowing our identity, who we are. And I think that that's one of the things that Israel was struggling with at the very beginning coming out. He had to get them to understand their identity, who they were, and that they were valued, and they were loved, uh, and then he cared for them. Um, in Romans 8, 17, he says, um, or starting in 16, it says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. So again, you know, the, this notion that um, we are heirs to God. So this idea of redemption uh, has this uh, pattern that, that we see in, in this great story of salvation. That as an example, Jesus uh, is the rock. Jesus is the was the cloud Jesus was there Jesus is the lawgiver um, he, he's very active in in the salvation of Israel we see that in, in the story that he's very active in that um, and as he is active in our salvation in our life in our experiences um, bringing uh, to us um, sal salvation um, I'll share something with you um, In Deuteronomy 32, uh, 10 through 12, um, there is a, another description that God um, uses to describe himself. Um, so he uses you know, the description of being an eagle, um, but then he uses another description, which I really, uh, really like very much. So Deuteronomy 10, I'm sorry, Deut Deuteronomy 32, um, verse 10 through 12, yeah. Um, he says, in a desert land, and he found him in a barren and howling waste. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as an apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nets and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings and catches them and carries them up on its pinions. The Lord alone led uh led him no foreign god was with him um so so that's that portion and then the other one um was um he says to not be afraid let's see where i read that that he was going to carry him like a father carries his son there's one two He says that he would he would carry them and, and he uses the example. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. Um, Twenty. Uh, then I said to you, do not be terrified, do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God, who is going to before you, will fight for you, and um, as he did for you um, in Egypt, before your very eyes. And in the desert that you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until he, you reached this place. So this, this, this picture that he paints that, um, you know, one of, of an eagle, but I really like this one, which is uh, of a picture of a father carrying his son until they got to the place. And he says, you know, you assured him, don't be afraid. Um, 
you know, um, this idea that God carries. I, I do remember having memories of being little and uh, not wanting to walk and having my, uh, and I think in this case it was my mom carried me, <laughs> carrying me, you know, and, and I remember just, you know, uh, sometimes falling asleep on her, you know, as she was taking me somewhere, she would carry me, um, that it was a very reassuring feeling. It was, you know, I was tired, you know, I didn't want to walk, um, but she, she was able to do those things. And so I really related uh, very much to this, um, um, to this description of God uh, and his care uh, for them. It's also it was um, also interesting that um, uh, I thought in the in the lesson when it talks about um, uh, how God you know redeemed um, Israel um, the word in the ex in, in, in the Hebrew uh, refers to a, a family member buying back or ransoming another f uh, member of a family um, especially when that family was in slavery or in debt uh, or about to go in, uh, into slavery. Um, Israel apparently had no uh, uh, earthly relatives to redeem her, but God was now Israel's relative or her kinsman redeemer uh, to redeem them, and that and that's what God, what God did for them. Um, Goyal, that's right. Goyal, that's the term. So now you get to um, verse um, 19 and 24 of, of Exodus is kind of the, this outline of the uh, establishing of this covenant. And um, the interesting thing about the covenant is that it has this, um, you know, it, it's an agreement like we're sitting in the entrance room with somebody. Uh, you kind of outline what you're going to do. Um, so you had, um, first they, you know, they arrived this place uh, for being delivered and now God proposes, uh, proposes to them uh, this covenant uh, Exodus 19 uh, verse 3 to 6 um, so it says Moses went up to God and Yahweh called to him out of the mountain saying this is what you shall tell the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel um, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on Egypt's wings and brought you out to myself now therefore if you will indeed open my voice and keep my covenant then you shall be my own possession um, my own possession from among all the people for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel so this is uh, God's uh, talking to Moses telling them this is the message that you need to tell the people this is the agreement of the covenant that I want to make with them so we, we follow in the story that Moses goes to the elders and all of them, and he tells them, here's what God is saying, that he wants to make you this, you know, special kingdom, and you're going to be priests and, um, if we keep his covenant. And what was their response? You know, yeah, we, 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 will, do, we will do what you say, right? We'll, we, we, will keep, we will keep this covenant. We, we, we will do it. Um, and then, um, so, th so they accept the covenant, um, what was you know their their response, and and then preparation is being made. So you know I think in verses um, seven to eight, you know he told the people, the all people said all that Yahweh has spoken we will do, and Moses reported the words to Yahweh. Um, then after that, uh, it, there's a preparation that is being made, uh, and. God speaks to Moses and he says, I'm going to come back to you in a thick cloud. And um, when I speak to you, you know, I want the people to hear it so that they can believe you. Right. Um, and Yahweh said to Moses, go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments. So there was this whole process you had to prepare, you had to stay away from the mountain, you know, prepare yourselves. Uh, there was this period of time uh, where they had to contemplate and think. Um, and... Um, why do you think that um, in this uh, arrangement, um, you, know, you know, all these steps, um, 
why, 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 is God, why, why didn't just God just say, hey, you're going to be my people and call it, you know, just, just be good? Why does he go through all these kind of steps um, to almost, you know, ratify their, their um, disagreement? You know, he's like, uh, he asks him to prepare. Then, um, then he speaks the Ten Commandments to them. He says, you know, th this is what you uh, will do. Um, and then Moses is kind of this, still this intermediator between the people and God, right? This says, you know, we don't, we don't want him to talk to us. You talk to us. You know, you, um, um, but the covenant continues God, you know, to be spelled out. Um, and it seems like God almost gives him another opportunity to, and, and, and to ratify this covenant. You know, are, do you, are you in agreement with this? Um, to me, what I got out of it was that he goes through this process because he's not a God that forces. He, he's one that he wants buy-in and an understanding. So there's this mutuality. Um, um, and, and I never picked up on that, that you know, he, he had given them the opportunity to agree or not agree. Do you, do you really want to enter into this, into this relationship? Are you, are, you, are you willing to do this? Um, so, you know, this covenant or this agreement uh, that he makes with them, you know, again, fulfilling, you know, all these other covenants, but in my mind, it really goes back to the Abrahamic covenant that, that he uh, reveals to them uh, and establishes them uh, through faith. Um, and in the lesson, I think it's in uh, Tuesday's portion, uh, the bottom of it, uh, he says, um, though the Lord had redeemed Israel from the bondage of Egypt, he wanted them to understand that redemption had a greater, more significant meaning than merely freedom from physical bondage. He wanted to redeem them from sin, the ultimate slavery, and it could happen only through the sacrifice of the Messiah, as taught in the types and symbols of the sanctuary service. It is no wonder then that not long after they were redeemed from bondage and given the law, that Israelites were instructed to build the sanctuary and establish its services. For in these things God revealed to them the plan of redemption, which is the true meaning and purpose of the covenant. For the covenant is nothing if not a covenant of salvation that the Lord offers to fallen humanity that is the same as what is in Eden as what is in Sinai. So I thought that was... Uh, well put in terms of just very succinct on uh, how um, the law in this covenant was uh, meant to uh, show them uh, to make them a kingdom of priests, to make them prepare to know um, what God was going to do, that he was going to send his son, that all the nations of the, of the earth were going to be blessed because of, uh, th through Abraham, uh, through Jesus. Um, that was... Um, pretty pretty amazing in Deuteronomy 29 verse 10 through 13 it said all of you stand this day in the presence of Yahweh your God your, your heads your tribes your elders all your officers even all the men of Israel your little ones your wives and the foreigners who are in the midst of the camps from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water that you may enter into the covenant of Yahweh your God and into his oath which Yahweh your God makes with you this day. Um, notice that it's his oath that they're entering into, um, that, ye, uh, that he may establish you this day as his people and that he may be your God as he spoke to you, as he swore to his fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Again, you know, it's um, God's faithfulness that keeps being revealed over and over. Um, in, through through these um, th through this relationship, it's always God's um, faithfulness. Um, in Wednesday's portion of the lesson, God and Israel, uh, welcome. Um, he says, um, "Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandment, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me of all the people of, um, for all the people of the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt keep." unto the children of Israel. So um, what was the purpose of uh, 
God establishing them as a kingdom of priests, you know, what was, what, what, what's behind that idea of, of being a nation? Um, what, what does that imply, I guess, maybe? Is, yeah. When we see Jesus coming, you know, in, 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 in the New Testament, uh, the, you know, the fulfillment of that promise, when Jesus comes, uh, Israel somehow, though, doesn't really recognize him. Um, the priests, you know, uh, were trying to kill him. Um, they, uh, they, 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 they weren't uh, supportive of his ministry. It seems like something had gone wrong in the, this covenant relationship. Um, it seemed like there was something that went wrong uh, with them uh, in establishing this covenant and things that they were supposed to do to keep the law. It seems like they went from the promise being this very broad promise, and to be a kingdom of uh, and a nation of um, to take the king, you know, like you said, spread the word to others, and yet it became a very this seems like the opposite, where they became very parochial, and the salvation was because we were Jews, and it belongs to us because we are the chosen people, and do we have? I wonder, you know, do we have the same susceptibility or? Uh, problem that we could become very parochial in our view of salvation, in our view of because we keep the Sabbath or we come to church on you know Saturday. Do we can we become that way with others, just like they did? Because it's they seem to have taken it to this, you know, really opposite extreme, uh, where they were trying, they were doing these things, but they had seemed to have failed to recognize their true mission um, that God had for them. Uh, it seems like there was this, um, again, identity uh, uh, missed, uh, missed opportunity for them. Any, any thoughts on that or that, that anybody might have? Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. They 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 made the the law and their ceremonies. They 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 made all those things, and they made it a way of salvation. So if we do these things, we are saved without having a relationship. It was just like more like here. These are the things, and we will do them, which you know shows us that we can we could be doing the right things, and yet our, if our heart is not in the right place. Uh, it's kind of defeats the purpose of why we why we do things, right? So, and, and I think Jesus brought that out as he was then going through and, and, and talking to them, and he says, "You have heard it said, but I say, you know, in, in, in you know many in many examples, he bringing them back to uh, to script, bring them back to a deeper understanding uh, of what the law was." Um, this morning, I was as I was reading, there was a you know. A, can be the example where, um, you know, the Jews, they were debating wh wh what things are okay to do on the Sabbath, right? And so they said, is it, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? You remember the story of the man with the withered hand, uh, right? And so the, they, there was, in Jesus' time, there was two um, trains of thought about that. And one was, you can't heal on the Sabbath. You should, you know, other rabbis said, no, you, you can't heal on the Sabbath. As long as you've prepared whatever ointment, you've done it on Friday before the Sabbath, you can administer to save them. Um, but when you read the Sabbath command, there's nothing that says there anything about worship, coming to church. It doesn't say any of that. When you read, read the command, there are certain things that uh, it says and certain things it doesn't say. The one thing that it does is that it doesn't, not to work and not to then have others work for you. It means to offer rest. So God offers rest. Jesus came, if you remember, and he said, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest, right? So it's the same, the same idea that God offers us rest. God offered Israel rest. Um, the law was given, was this freedom because he said, you're gonna be blessed if you do these things. You know, if you do these things, you're gonna be happy. 
you know, and that's when Jesus comes in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, happy are you if you do these things. Because it's, you know, he was, you know, elaborating, you know, on, on that law. Uh, but with the man with the withered hand, you know, Jesus doesn't, you know, he asks him to stretch out his hand, right? And he says, and he gave him the example. He says, which of you who, you know, uh, has a sheep and he falls in a hole won't pull them out? Right? And it's like, well, most of them, they would have. They would have agreed, yes, we will pull them out. And he says, isn't a man worth more than a sheep? You know, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Um, and so, you know, in that one example, Jesus, you know, is in co complete, you know, opposite of where the, um, you know, the rulers of the day were in, ter in terms of how they, you know, you know, applied, you know, and what they thought they needed to do to be saved. They had all these rules and regulations of things that you must do and things that you couldn't do, washings, things that you had to do. Um, and, and yet, for Jesus, it was about saving somebody, having a relationship with somebody, and freeing somebody from suffering. He says the Sabbath, God, so God's law is a, God, is a law of love, and it's a law of life. And then and in the Sabbath, he, he just basically further demonstrates that God is a God that wants us to um, have rest from our labors, trusting in, you know, what we can do to, you know, earn a living. He says, hey, take a break. You know, I'm going to take care of you. You don't need to work. You know, that's not, you know, what it's about. You need to rest. And you need to other, offer others rest. And not only others, like he says, like, you know, those who work for you, you know, your servants, your maidservant. But he also talks about the animals, the cattle. You know, it's like God cares about them. And he's like, it's almost like he was putting them, you know, by, by in the Sabbath commandment, by, by him mentioning cattle as well, you know, to offer rest, you know, to the beasts of burden, you know, shows kind of the, mag, you know, magnanimity of God that he's this God of love and that offers rest and care for his creation. Um, and so, you know, I just think it's, it's just a beautiful thing that they did. But, but again, you know, Israel had lost sight of the covenant promise, didn't understand um, what their role was, their identity, um, because even, yes? No, go ahead. Mm -hmm. That's when I understood, because uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, fell, and disobeyed God, then there was this. Um, uh, it was the Chas of sin. Yes. Uh, I mean, actually, uh, Adam and Eve yeah. and Adam and Eve had it in heaven. Right. But, uh, when Adam and Eve fell, then they had to be redeemed from their position and to install the sanctuary that was introduced in Christ before Jesus. Exactly. Unfortunately, uh, even those who understand about Jesus' death on the cross still misinterpreted when he said it is finished. They thought, well, okay, no more Ten Commandments, no more He did it all on the cross. Hmm. And all we have to do is believe in him. And so there's also on the other side of yes. the spectrum what's missing. Mm -hmm. in Yes. Yeah, I, 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 lo I, love, I love what you just said, um, and, and it's so true. And, um, you know, I, um, I think it was a year ago, I, you know, started looking, I think it was, I was listening to a sermon, it was David Astrick who it was sharing about that the story and the narrative of Scripture is about God reaching out and providing salvation and fulfilling that. So in, in Abraham, he makes a promise you know, and he keeps his promise. Jesus comes, fulfills everything that we couldn't do. That's why Jesus had to become one of us because we could not have kept it. He came not only as, you know, God, but he comes as human, taking on our flesh, and he fulfills 
that part of the covenant, you know, he, he fulfills that for us. And so, yes, we believe in him, but our obedience is because we love what he's done for him. We believe, you know, that, and, and that drives us to obedience. We obey and we want to keep his commands because we realize that his commands are not burdensome. They're actually, they're love and they're, they make us happy. They make us life better. You know, all these things that he promised to them, he, he offers that and it makes us, our life better. So, you know, when I was younger, I didn't understand that. And so like Sabbath was like, oh, I couldn't go out and play. I couldn't do these things um, because it was, you know, again, a wrong perception because our ideas of God, the pictures that we have, sometimes we'll portray those to others and it might not be the right picture of God you know, the beautiful picture of his saving grace and of, of his love for us. And so I think that that's, um, you know, something that, you know, once we know that truth, we can't help but share it, you know, and, and to, to, to share it with others to say, hey, you know, I want you to know about Jesus because this is what he's done for me and, and all the blessings. And, um, and, and I think that's the hope that we have, right? And we look forward to uh, the continuation of God's promise because it's not over. We're continuing that, and, uh, you know, he's, he's going to come back. We know he's going to come back soon, right? Amen. He's, gonna, he's coming back soon. He promises to come back soon where all those things will be restored. And just like Israel, you know, all those, you know, the, the promises he made, the song of Moses, you know, it's a song of freedom and liberation. It's a song that we're going to be able to sing as well. Um, so we, we, look forward, we look forward to that. Um, the, the bell rang, and so we have to uh, close now and, Thank you all for your participation. Thank you for your comments. And uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Um, Father in heaven, we uh, thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the way that you keep your promises, Lord. Uh, we have failed in many ways, but Father, you are faithful, and for that we give you thanks. We pray that through your spirit that you would uh, help us to be faithful to you, uh, that we would get to know you better, that we would uh, love you, and that we would be uh, recognize our identity in you, and that we uh, would bring others, Lord, to that knowledge uh, and that saving grace that only through you we might be saved. And so, Father, we ask a blessing for everyone who's here today. Uh, pray that you would uh, uh, richly bless them and fill them with your spirit. And uh, as we go on to the next service, Lord, may we continue to be blessed by knowing you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.